Thank you. Oof, very bright. Um, happy to be here. Um, so what I'll talk about today is uh, space mesh. So this is a race-free consensus based on proofs of space-time. I'll talk about what all that means. And it's joint work with uh, Ido Bentov, uh, Julian Loss, um, and myself. <laughs> OK, so let's start with a little bit of introduction, even though you probably, most of you already know this, um, just so we're all on the same page, um, which is cryptocurrency. What, what actually are the ingredients that make up a cryptocurrency? So I think the most important thing is a distributed consensus. That is some way to get everyone to agree on what the current state of the world is. And when we're talking about a cryptocurrency, by world we mean where all the money is. Right? So if, if we don't agree where the money is, we don't have a cryptocurrency. And it's not enough that we agree where the money is, we also have to agree on the rules of how this state evolves. So specifically for uh, cryptocurrencies, for instance, it's important that history is irreversible, right? If I gave somebody money uh, last week, then I can't decide that I didn't give it to them uh, today. And then the second part of a cryptocurrency is incentive mechanisms. So running a cryptocurrency uh, has costs, right? We costs in CPU and storage, network, and if we want uh, honest people to participate in the system, we have to give them some incentives to do so. And usually this means uh, money. And of course I include in this area the sort of second layer of, of the economics of the uh, uh, cryptocurrency, uh, how things work above that. So I'm coming from a, a cryptography background, and in this talk I'm going to actually mainly focus on the consensus part. And the, the incentive mechanisms are important. I'll, I'll speak a little bit about um, how our uh, consensus algorithms actually help us with the incentive mechanisms. But there's a whole lot to talk about there that I'm just uh, going to ignore for now, given the, the limited amount of time. OK, so the first thing to know about consensus is that consensus is really hard. And it's a classic problem in distributed computing. You know, we've been working on it since the 80s. We're still studying it today. There's still new papers being written all the time about consensus mechanisms, definitely now, but even before the blockchain explosion. And the main challenge here is that you have lots of parties who want to agree, but you don't know which of them are honest, right? Some of them might be acting maliciously, and because you don't know, it, it's hard to decide who to uh, listen to and who not to listen to. So classic consensus is hard, Permissionless consensus, where we don't have fixed identities, that's just impossible, right? The reason is that adversaries can create many Sybil identities, right? If we don't have identities, then I can just duplicate myself as many times as I want. And we've known, actually, there's a mathematical proof, we've known from the 80s, that if we don't have an honest majority, then it's just impossible to get consensus. There's always some attack that can uh, violate the, the requirements we want from consensus. And of course, if the adversaries can duplicate themselves as many times as they want, then there's no way to get an honest majority, right? So there's no way um, we can get consensus in a permissionless setting. Okay, but we're still here, right? So how come we do get consensus in a permissionless setting? Well, I think that the main, the brilliant idea of, uh, of Satoshi was let's change the model. Okay, we're not going to look at parties anymore with identities that we can't verify. Let's count computational work instead. And computational work has some nice properties. So for example, it's very easy to measure. So I can check how much work you're doing because there are sort of simple proofs. And it's also very hard to fake. So given sort of very reasonable cryptographic assumptions, I can't prove to you I did work without actually doing the work. And because computational power is uh, a limited and expensive resource, this basically solves our Sybil problem. Right? I cannot create many uh, identities because I don't have uh, enough uh, CPU power. And of course, this brings us to our new assumption, right? Before, in, in classic uh, consensus algorithms, our assumption was honest parties 
control, uh, sorry, our assumption was there are a majority of honest parties. And now our assumption is the honest parties control a majority of the CPU power. Okay, so we have this assumption and we've sidestepped the impossibility result. How did Satoshi get from there to an actual consensus mechanism? Well, his idea was we're going to elect a leader. This happens basically by everybody trying to solve this proof of work and whoever gets to solve it is elected leader. And now the leader gets to determine the next block um, or the general terms, basically the history. The leader gets to determine what happens uh, in say this 10 minute period. And because most of the time there's only a single leader because of the difficulty of this puzzle and, and the way we choose the parameters, we get consensus, right? If there's only one, everybody can agree, okay, that's the leader and we all agree on what happened. So, so that's wonderful. But the problem is that this is all probabilistic and we can't guarantee that there's only a single leader every time. So sometimes multiple leaders are chosen at the same time, like say two people uh, solve the proof of work more or less uh, together. And in that case, we have a race. And the problem with the race is that because we have to have consensus on one, then somebody's block is going to get uh, deleted. Right? Somebody is, had done the work, but is not going to get rewarded for it. Okay, so what are the, the problems with races? So races are time sensitive, right? Because it matters who gets there first, suddenly I really care about how fast I can get my solution to everyone. And this means that we have a high competitive uh, cost for large blocks, right? If I want to increase the block size, it takes me longer to transmit my block. And that means that I'm more likely to lose the race compared to somebody who has a smaller block. Um, and uh, this, this is a problem, the, the block size limitation, because we want to have more transactions, right? And the, the more uh, transactions we have, the larger we want the blocks to be. And so this gives us some limit on what the throughput is in terms of transactions. We also get perverse incentives. So for example, if you look at Bitcoin, Sometimes it's actually better in terms of uh, my own uh, reward to withhold blocks. Instead of to send my block immediately to everyone, it's better for me to keep the block to myself. And then uh, maybe somebody else will publish sort of the wrong kind of block and I can uh, publish my block later and uh, get more rewards. And this is bad for the system. And finally, there's this problem of unfair reward distribution. And so one thing you can see, for example, is that if I just generated a block, I know the contents of this block before uh, I transmitted it, because I just generated it. So I know it before everybody else. I get a head start now on generating the next block, which means that if I have a lot of computational power, I get more than my fair share of the reward because I'm getting a head start uh, all the time. Okay, so we said races are, are bad, but proofs of work themselves are also bad. Why? Because computational power is an expensive, limited resource. And here, it's especially important to note that it's expensive, not just in terms of monetary costs, but also in terms of environmental costs, right? I think Bitcoin is uh, equivalent to something like a medium-sized country by now. That's a lot of carbon in the air and a lot of sad polar bears. Um, and this is something that's inherent to proof of work. We can't take proof of work and say, well, maybe we'll try to work a little bit less, because the whole point here is that we need the honest miners to have a majority of the power. And if they stop working, only the adversaries will keep working, and so we will violate this honest majority assumption. And finally, because it's so expensive in monetary terms, then we're going to be paying this in transaction costs, because we have to reimburse the miners who are doing all this work and the way we reimburse miners, at least in a steady state where we hopefully will have a, a lot less speculation, um, the way we reimburse them is through transaction fees. Okay, so this brings us to space mesh and what our motivations are. So the first thing is that we want to replace proofs of work with some different resource, something that's hopefully more environmentally friendly. And the second thing is that we want to remove this leader election requirement. And this will give us a, a fair reward distribution that's linear in the amount of resources you have. It'll allow us to increase the throughput uh, 
quite a lot because now we don't, don't have this time sensitivity so we can make larger blocks and we'll see we can actually make more blocks at the same time. And it gives us these really nice incentive compatibility properties. So we can basically show that if this protocol has uh, no races, if it's race free, then it's actually uh, incentive compatible. It's, it's good for you to follow the protocol and to publish your blocks immediately. Because uh, the way we define race free, it means that no matter what anybody else does, the honest users will get their reward. So by not publishing a block, you can't uh, cancel somebody else's block. You can, at worst, cause yourself to lose money. OK, and finally, um, our motivation in designing Space Mesh was to have something that we can formally analyze and prove secure. And this isn't actually just an afterthought. I think in the space of, of uh, cryptography and security, unlike sort of uh, regular algorithms, if we cannot, uh, uh, we can't just check things by experimenting because we can never uh, experiment on what the attack is going to be. So really, the only way to get confidence that our systems are secure is to have some formal proof. Of course, this doesn't you know, formally prove that there's nothing that can attack them, but at least it can reduce the attack surface to some well-studied assumptions. And say, look, if I, you can attack this, then you can attack lots of other things that lots of people have studied, rather than, you know, this is a, a secure protocol, that's our assumption, and you know, we don't know how secure it is because we don't know how to attack it. Okay, so those are our motivations. What can we use as alternatives to uh, proofs of work? Well, one thing that uh, you've already heard about and people are, have already begun using is money. Basically, instead of work, we'll use money directly. This is proofs of stake. And this is very cheap in terms of the cost of the miners because it only requires uh, signatures. So that's pretty good. Uh, second uh, option, which is what uh, we're going to use, is proofs of space-time. And by proofs of space-time, what I mean is keeping your disk full for a specified period of time. So you might have heard the notion of proofs of space. Actually, the, the constructions will also satisfy the, our notion of proof of space-time. This is a, a technical difference. It doesn't really matter. But the proofs of space-time are sort of the right definition for what we actually need to get uh, cryptocurrencies. Okay, so proofs of space-time are much cheaper than proofs of work because storing data is uh, a lot cheaper than uh, you're using your CPU. Um, and they're definitely much, much cheaper in terms of environmental cost because the energy they require is a lot less. They're not quite as cheap as, cheap as the proofs of stake. But we'll see that this is actually an advantage. So what's wrong with proofs of stake? Why, why did we decide to go to proofs of space-time? Um, so proofs of stake are very cheap. They're actually too cheap. And the reason is there's nothing that prevents me from basically simulating an entire alternate history in my head. OK, there is something that prevents me from doing that. I don't know the keys, the secret keys of the people who are holding the stake. But in order to uh, get security in this sense, I'll now need some additional security assumptions that might be a little uh, non-standard. For example, if I want to ensure that I can never get the honest user's keys ever, because once I have them for even some time very far in the past, I can sort of simulate the entire history, then I'll need to assume something like honest users can securely erase memory. And this is pretty suspect, because we know that erasing things practically is not easy. And th there are lots of other things uh, that are uh, problematic with this. There are other ways to solve this except for erasing memories, but they're all sort of different, slightly non-standard assumptions. Secondly, proofs of stake are not quite permissionless, right? Why? Because I can't decide on my own to sort of join the system. I have to ask somebody who has stake to give me some of the stake. So I need to get uh, technically somebody's permission. Um, and this seems maybe just sort of a technicality, but in existing systems, it actually has an effect. So existing systems, uh, have sort of minimum stake requirements, and it's pretty high. It means that it's hard for small users. I don't have the, the minimum uh, requirement. It's hard for us to join the system. 
So it, this hurts the, the decentralized nature of the system, which in turn affects security. And finally, there's a sort of circularity problem. We talk about formal proofs. What does the, uh, the security of the system rely on? Well, it relies on the integrity of stake because we're using that to prove security. But the integrity of stake relies on the security of the system. This seems sort of circular. Um, there are ways around that, so it's possible to prove, but it's very tricky, and these proofs are a lot uh, harder and more subtle than proofs of, uh, based on, on sort of uh, things that have a cost. Okay, so let's uh, have a brief overview of the space mesh consensus mechanism. So I'm not going to give any technical details, basically, um, because uh, there's lack of time. I hope I'll have a few minutes afterwards for questions, but if not, you can, I'll be here for the rest of the day. I, I'm happy to have questions and talk about it later. So uh, I want to first say this is the space mesh uh, algorithm is based on a previous protocol that I talked about here last year uh, called MeshCache, which was joint work with uh, Ido Bentov, Pavel Hubacek, and uh, Asaf Nadel. So what do we do in space mesh? Well, first we have a lottery to pick the block generators, which are the parties who get to generate blocks. And the way we run this lottery is uh, a party is eligible uh, only if they have space. So basically, we look at the uh, entire space that's allocated to space mesh, and we pick sort of random uh, uniform sample of this space, and whoever controls that space gets to generate a block. And how many do we pick? Well, uh, we pick a, a sample size that depends on our security parameter, and uh, you can think of it as something like between 50 and 200 uh, blocks that are picked every time. And now everybody who got picked can generate a block and we accept all of the valid blocks. So unlike these leader election based protocols where we can only choose one and we have to figure out which one's the best, if you got picked, you get to generate a block. And if you're a little bit late, it's fine as long as you're within some reasonable bounds. Um, so how do we organize these blocks? We organize them in layers. So we have a layer every clock tick. Think of a clock tick as, say, five minutes. And every block explicitly says in which layer they belong. So we have blocks that say they're in layer one, blocks that say in layer two. And of course, honest users will always put the right number there. Like if, if the clock tick is now the second clock tick, I'll put two when I generate a block there. And if we have uh, layers, and every block says which layer it's in, and we know exactly wh how many, or exactly which blocks are in each layer, this gives us a total order over the blocks. So how do we get a total order? First, we order by layer number. So um, say anything in layer four comes after anything in layer three. And inside a layer, we can use, say, the hash IDs of the blocks to order them. So fine, we, we get a total ordering, and they, that's basically what we need. Okay, but there's a problem, and I'm actually fudging a little bit. We don't get a total ordering, and the reason is that honest parties don't actually agree on the exact time for each block. This is sort of the main technical difficulty in how to get consensus. And why is it a problem? Because we cannot accept blocks that come uh, too early or too late, and in particular, too late. Why? Suppose we would accept blocks no matter when they were generated. I have a block in layer two, but it's generated three days afterwards. If I accept it as part of layer two, then suddenly I'm changing history, right? Layer two is a long time ago. So I can definitely not accept a block that is generated a week afterwards. And by induction, there is some point at which, some threshold where I cannot accept a block that came after this threshold and still get the irreversibility requirements that we want. So how do we agree which blocks to accept if we don't agree on the exact timing, right? Because one honest party might think a block was before the threshold and one might think it's after the threshold. Okay, so here the, the idea is we're going to just vote, right? Every block is going to vote on the validity of all previous blocks. And then in order to decide whether a block is really valid, I'm not going to uh, look at its exact timing. I'm going to count the votes and let the majority decide. Now, the majority of blocks are generated honestly. This, this is because of our assumption that a majority of, of the resources of the space, sorry? Um, sorry, 
Um, so uh, a majority of the blocks are generated honestly because the majority of the space is controlled by honest blocks. And when we sample randomly, almost always we will get a majority that is honest. So uh, this means that if all the honest blocks are voting the same way, when we look at the majority vote, it's always going to be the one that we agree with. Right? And uh, this means that uh, the new blocks will always be uh, voting according to the consensus on old blocks. And using basically the exact same argument as Bitcoin, we can guarantee irreversibility. Because the new blocks are generated at a faster rate, uh, the, the honest blocks are generated at a faster rate than uh, any dishonest blocks, the, the number of votes for a block is always going to agree with the honest ones in a larger and larger margin. And as time goes on, it's going to be basically impossible to reverse this. OK, so we call this protocol the tortoise protocol. Why? Because it steadily uh, advances right every clock tick, and it guarantees that you know things will stay the same in, in the past. It's uh, very steady and secure, but it's not the whole story. Why isn't it the whole story? Because what the tortoise protocol does is it gives us consensus if all the honest parties agree on validity, and it makes it irreversible after enough time has passed because the uh, the votes add up. And I would just want to note that enough time here is a single layer. Because we're using 100 blocks per layer or, or uh, something on that order, right? If we, and we're using the exact same argument as Bitcoin, it's enough to have a six block advantage to get irreversibility. Here we're going to have 100 blocks or say a majority of them. So uh, I know 50 something blocks at a time. So once we've got that, we're fine. But that's not enough because this uh, assumes that honest parties agree on the new blocks. And how do we get that? So this is where we add another part of the protocol, which we call the hair protocol. And the hair protocol is basically a Byzantine fault-tolerant agreement on the recent blocks. So the construction here is quite modular. We can choose different kinds of hair protocols uh, for different security and efficiency trade-offs. For example, originally we were thinking of using uh, an asynchronous protocol because they have nice uh, efficiency advantages. Uh, we're probably going to end up using a synchronous protocol because there's a lower bound on, in asynchronous protocols. You have to have a two-thirds majority for them to work. In synchronous protocols, you can get by with uh, uh, just a standard majority, so you get better security. Um, so it's, it's nice that you can just uh, switch these around. But the important thing is the hair protocol uh, is just a regular Byzantine agreement that causes all honest parties to agree on what the recent blocks are. So just to see how this thing looks, suppose this is our timeline. To decide whether recent blocks are valid, we look at the results of this hair protocol. And that will just tell us, honest parties will just use those results uh, to decide. They will ignore the votes for those, or maybe not enough votes even at, at that point. For anything that's old enough that we, have, we can already start counting votes, we'll use the tortoise protocol. We'll count the votes and decide according to the votes. So we still get all these nice irreversibility properties. And maybe there are some blocks that are so new we haven't even finished running the hair protocol on them. So in that case, we wait, right? Until we finish running the hair protocol, we don't know yet whether they're valid or not. Okay, so that's in a nutshell how the consensus protocol works. Um, but what I've shown you so far is that we have an, a total order on blocks, right? We, we, have, uh, we can tell for every block whether it's before or after another block. But when we... Uh, running a cryptocurrency, we care usually about the order between transactions, not between blocks. The nice thing is that actually if we have a total order on blocks, then it will also give us a total order on transactions. How? Basically in the same way that we get the total order on blocks from the ordering of uh, layers, and the, how, which blocks are in which layer. Right? We can order first by block and then inside the block by uh, by the hash. And notice here that we don't even care that there are conflicting transactions or transactions that appear multiple times because we can do all this after the fact, right? We first look at the order on the blocks, and then we can look at the order on the transactions. If there's a, a conflict, we know that the first one is the one that counts, and the second one we can ignore it. So it's a nice uh, generic system where the transactions, we really don't care about the, the semantics of transactions. We only care about the fact that there's strings. OK, so what I've told you so far sort of didn't uh, take into account space the, or the, the special peculiarities of proofs of space at all. 
But there are actually some challenges when you try to move from proofs of work to proofs of space time. So for example, in proofs of work, the effort that you, you uh, incur in making this proof is bound to your vote, right? To, to which block you think is the right previous block. And this makes it easy to set up these robust lotteries. It's hard to cheat in. Whereas in proofs of space-time that are based on storage, the stored data cannot depend on the vote. Why? Because uh, the whole point is you're going to store data and you're not going to change it all the time. If you change it all the time, it means uh, you're doing work. So your vote changes, your stored data doesn't change, so your stored data cannot depend on the vote. So, so the effort you incur, basically you're using the same effort multiple times. This causes a problem that uh, we call nothing at stake. There's a similar problem, even worse, in uh, proof of stake systems. Secondly, uh, proofs of work are non-interactive. That is, if I get a proof of work, it's a single message, and I can just verify it by looking at that message. I don't need any other information. I know that somebody uh, did the work in order to generate that message. On the other hand, proofs of space-time are based on storage over time. So I need to show that I stored something for a week. But time is subjective. I, the message itself doesn't sort of prove that it happened a week ago. And proofs of space-time actually have these two parts. They have a commitment part where I, I've started storing, and then they have the proof part where it says I'm still storing it. And the distance between these two is something that is not included in the contents of the message, right? If, if I was, uh, a week ago, I received the commit message, then I know it was a week ago. But if I'm just waking up now and I see the entire blockchain or the, all, all the blocks so far, I don't know whether things happened uh, this week or last week or a year ago. So I have this problem that we call costless history extension, where um, I can sort of pretend things happened far in the past, even though I've only started working very recently. So how do we deal with these uh, problems? Well, for the nothing at stake problem, um, what we do is, first of all, note that space is bound to an ID. It's not bound to your vote, but it is bound to your identity. And creating new identities is costly because your identity is the space you generate, and to generate space actually costs work. And that's inherent in proof of space-time systems because if generating, uh, filling up your space did not cost work, then you wouldn't want to store things. You could just recreate them by, working, by, by uh, not doing work again. So every time you create the storage for the first time, you do have to do some work, and that's why it's costly. And therefore, by this honest majority assumption, the adversary cannot create too many fake, uh, not fake, you cannot create too many IDs. And whenever the adversary tries to reuse an ID by using the same space for two different votes, because we look at all the votes, we're not looking just at one chain, we can immediately tell that there are two votes that are being used with the same ID in the same slot, and then we can just cancel the vote. And we don't actually need any punishments here. The, the, all these, uh, the proofs here, the security, is all worst case. It's not based on rational parties doing the right thing because of incentives. It's, uh, it's a worst case analysis, and we only rely on this uh, honest majority of storage, right? Because what we show is that when you cancel, even if you cancel all the old votes of the adversaries, once you're irreversible, you can't change things because there are too many honest votes. Okay, what about the costless history extension? Um, there we have this nice trick where we combine um, uh, proof of elapsed time with the proof of space time. And basically the idea is that we're using the commit phase of the, of the proof of space time as the challenge to the proof of elapsed time. Then we use the proof of elapsed time as the challenge to the proof phase of the, of the post. And therefore we get a proof that's self-contained and it shows that you actually spent time doing it. And finally, I want to say a, another property that we get uh, that I think is very important for uh, cryptocurrency systems is something that I call self-healing, which is if something bad does happen, right? Everything we prove that, you know, with high probability, two to the minus 40, bad things will never happen. But it's not never, it's two to the minus 40. So over many years, things can happen. And the system can actually recover from a temporary violation of assumptions. And the way we do this is that we add an extra ingredient to the tortoise protocol that's taken from traditional uh, Byzantine agreement protocols, which is a common public coin. And basically, we assume that there's a coin that's published uh, at the beginning of every layer. We don't assume it. We show how to do it. But for now, let's assume it. And now we modify this voting rule so that instead of just 
looking at the majority, um, we sort of have three ranges. If there's a large majority, then we use the majority. But if it's small, we use the coin. And basically, the idea is if the coin is in the right direction, then everybody will agree. And that happens with high probability within only a few layers. So we get this self-healing as well. Um, OK, due to lack of time, I'm not going to talk about how we get the tortoise to be more efficient. But what I described now is horribly inefficient uh, up till now. Uh, of course, that's not what we actually do. Um, we actually do things that are uh, a bit better. Um, and additional things that I'm not going to talk about is how we get the tortoise to be even better than that, um, how we sample the committees. There are a lot of details here that we uh, have in the protocol that we just cannot go over now, and how we construct the hair protocol itself. Uh, and of course, as I said, all of these incentive structures, there's a whole extra layer here that also has a lot of work in it um, that we'll ignore for the purposes of this talk. And finally, the security proofs, which are very important and uh, I will not even give you a hint of how they work. Thank you.